The recent Pentagon leaks informed us that the war wasn't exactly going to plan for Ukraine. The outlook was somewhat grim in those documents, and yet some present narratives paint a very different picture. The narrative keeps changing, and it's not easy to figure out what's really going on. Today we'll look at some new intel and how this war might end, but first we need to understand what was in those leaks. On April 13, 2023, some residents of North Dighton, Massachusetts in the USA were just a little bit peeved when they couldn't get home because police cars were blocking the road. Little did they know that the reason for the blockage was that an innocent-looking kid was being arrested by the U.S. Air Force National Guard for a crime that'll go down in American history. The man was a 21-year-old named Jack Douglas Tejera. News reports were soon saying that this guy was responsible for the worst and most embarrassing set of top-secret leaks since Julian Assange's WikiLeaks website published around 700,000 classified documents in 2010. Tejera, who was an airman first class at Otis Air National Guard Base in Massachusetts, had joined the Air National Guard in 2019 with the job title of Cyber Transport Systems Journeyman, or simply an IT specialist. The media said Tejera could spend many more years in prison, 20 to 25 years, since the leaks were so damaging. Starting as early as October 2022, Tejera had posted leaks on the messaging platform Discord on a server named Thug Shaker Central, after which they made the rounds on various social media platforms. The classified documents were mostly related to the Russo-Ukrainian war. Both those nations were somewhat rattled, even if they downplayed the exposure of these 100-plus pages of classified papers. The leaks in some cases were a bad look for the USA. You'll see at the end of the show why that matters a lot regarding what's going to happen in the war. Turned out that Tejera had photographed the sensitive and highly classified material at his parents' house. The documents covered various departments, including the Central Intelligence Agency, the U.S. National Security Agency, and the Bureau of Intelligence and Research of the State Department. It's thought Tejera was one of around 1 million Americans that have access to classified material. You might wonder why he did it. Was he ideologically and politically motivated, like the other leakers that came before him, such as the aforementioned Assange or whistleblower Edward Snowden? It seems he wasn't interested in matters of mass surveillance, atrocities, human rights, or that kind of thing. He wasn't even interested in the outcome of the war, either. Even though he'd posted stuff that arguably affected what was happening in the war. So, why did he do it? A writer for The Atlantic called Tejera, not some whistleblower who thought he could do something positive for the world, but an immature guy just trying to impress his teenage friends. He was portrayed as just some kind of kid living in an era where getting attention online is almost the meaning of life for young folks. He was no martyr, thinking he was working on the so-called right side of history, said the news media. Whistleblowers often have supporters in various kinds of media, but not Tejera. He was certainly not portrayed as a hero in just about any mainstream media. He was an outlaw, a rebel without anything close to a cause. In fact, the New York Times and Washington Post helped the FBI bring him down, which historically speaking is quite unusual. This must have been serious. Something was different here from cases of leakers of classified info in the past. By the time this video ends, we hope you understand why this was such a special case. These leaks cover a lot of ground, from U.S. surveillance of a Mexican drug cartel to U.S. intelligence agents talking about the Russian Defense Ministry worrying about NATO having a bigger military presence in the Arctic. Another document states how the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban told his people at an internal political strategy session that the U.S. was actually in the top three when it came to his adversaries. He's extolled the governments of China, Russia, India, and Singapore in the past. However, Hungary later said his animus toward the U.S. wasn't exactly true. What he meant was specifically the Biden administration, not the U.S. in general. Turned out that Orban was concerned that the U.S. would meddle in this country's election. One of the biggest revelations was that the U.S.'s spying machine was not just focused on its enemies, but on its allies. The Guardian called it a panopticon of global U.S.-led intelligence, which included surveillance, eavesdropping, and breaching digital information systems through vulnerable back doors. Some of these documents were marked no foreign, meaning not releasable to foreign nationals. This included members of Five Eyes, the U.S. allied group of spy agencies in Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. U.S. intelligence was shown to have various spying mechanisms aimed at countries such as Israel and Ukraine, and also South Korea. But let's face it, if the leaks showed that the U.S. wasn't spying on its allies, you'd have been more surprised. Still, it matters and indirectly might affect the outcome of the war. China played a big part in the leaks, which should come as no surprise. Some of the papers discussed the possible Chinese invasion of Taiwan, with U.S. officials talking about how China would very quickly establish air superiority. There was also talks in the leaks about China wanting to send weapons to Russia disguised as civilian help. Now, if that were true, it would be huge, but there's no evidence that shows China has sent any arms to Russia. 
A U.S. administration official who chose to remain nameless told the media that the U.S. had no proof that this ever happened. China also has strenuously denied the charge. The leaks also show how the U.S. has been able to spy on the Russian Defense Ministry and the mercenary organization the Wagner Group. The latter has thousands of personnel fighting in Ukraine right now, and as you'll see, they're having a tough time in a tough battle. The documents say this group, under the control of the Russian oligarch and close confidant to Putin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, had asked China for munitions and equipment, but China had not sent anything. Russia was vindicated when the documents revealed that the U.S. has special forces deployed in Ukraine, 17 in all. Still, the U.S. soon said these men were deployed at the U.S. Embassy to help with the oversight of U.S. supplies and protecting staff, so they were not taking part in fighting. Again, this should hardly come as a surprise. The U.K. has 50 special forces troops deployed in Ukraine, France has 15, Latvia 17, the Netherlands 1, and whatever they're all doing there will not always be for public consumption. Other documents show that out of the 12 Ukrainian combat brigades, 9 were being trained by U.S. and NATO forces, 71 U.S. military personnel are stationed within Ukraine, said the documents along with 97 NATO Special Operations soldiers. This shouldn't come as any surprise either. The fact that the public hadn't been told is what made it a big deal. After all, this sounds like a lot closer to NATO going to war with Russia than many previously thought. If any of these soldiers are captured, you can be sure Russia will make a meal out of it, since Russia has always said this is a proxy war with the West, namely the US. Also, if a US soldier is killed, there's a very real risk of escalation. As some critics ask, should the public have been informed about these soldiers considering the risk of escalation? The documents show how US intelligence time and time again has been able to intercept Russian targeting plans. They show how the US was able to intercept information of when Russia was planning to hit bridges, railroads, thermoelectric power plants, and electric substations. This was indispensable intelligence for Ukraine, as was the ability of US intelligence to gather information on Russia's plan to combat NATO tanks. The documents also talked about casualties, stating that there have been anywhere from 189,500 to 223,000 Russian casualties and between 124,500 and 131,000 Ukrainian casualties. One of the documents said 15,500 to 17,500 Ukrainian soldiers had been killed in action and 35,500 to 43,000 Russian soldiers had been killed in action. You'll soon see how some analysts think these numbers aren't even close to the reality. Russia was accused of doctoring these documents to make the numbers look lower. Still, the truth is U.S. intelligence admitted in the leaks that such estimates were unreliable given the fog of war. We do know from another of the documents that in just one elite Russian unit, the 346th Spetsnaz Brigade, there were only 125 troops left out of the original 900 deployed. But perhaps more importantly, some of the documents show that the U.S. doesn't or at least didn't have much faith in Ukraine's spring counteroffensive due to Kyiv's shortfall in weaponry and air defenses. One document states that Ukraine's medium-range air defenses there to protect frontline troops will be completely reduced by May 23rd. The report suggested that Russia could then have aerial superiority, and Ukraine would subsequently lose the ability to move ground forces in the counteroffensive. A document talks about Ukraine not being battle-ready and the sustainment shortfalls of its military, which U.S. intelligence thought would mean modest territorial gains for Ukraine. The country needed 12 brigades armed with 253 tanks and around 1,500 armored vehicles, but at that time the document was compiled, five of the brigades hadn't even started training, and six had only half the equipment and weapons they needed. Things have changed since then, as we'll soon show you. What's certain is that Ukraine drastically needs more air defenses, its stocks of Soviet-era S-300 and Buk air defense systems, which are reported to make up 89% of Ukraine's air defenses, are all pretty much gone, said the documents. The U.S.'s fear was that when stocks were depleted, Russia would send in fighter jets and bombers, and the course of the war could change. The U.S. will send in air defense interceptors and munitions as part of a $2.6 billion package, and NATO is expected to come to Ukraine's aid. Still, the question is whether that will be enough to hold back the 485 Russian fighter jets deployed in the Ukraine theater, not to mention the drones and cruise missiles. We know this from the leaks. Ukraine will require various systems to defend against the variety of Russian attacks. So far, it's been supplied with Patriot missile systems, National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, and German-made Iris-T air defense batteries, which is promising for Ukraine, but perhaps not good enough at the moment. This is why the leaks and many analysts who spoke prior to the leaks are saying that there will be a stalemate and this war will go on for much longer. For many analysts, it's hard to see a decisive victory right now. Still, we must always remember that analysts have gotten it wrong before. 
and it's also very hard to understand more indirect matters of warfare such as troop morale and public sentiment in both Ukraine and Russia and beyond. Others say Ukraine was underestimated in the past, which is true, but no two counteroffensives are alike. Many things have changed. Much of the fighting as of late has happened in a key city of Bakhmut, a situation the leaks called catastrophic. People now talk about the bloodbath of Bakhmut and the humiliation of Putin as Russian corpses pile up. Ukrainian corpses have also been piling up. In this eastern Ukrainian city, which has been said to have little strategic value to Russia, losses for both sides have been in the many thousands. The press, for the most part, says Bakhmut is merely a symbolic fight for Russia. Others say it's more important than that. It sits in the middle of a regional road network in an area Ukraine has spent years building fortifications. Rather than purely symbolic, this is what another Ukraine war pundit said. These positions are absolutely critical for Ukraine to hold. The loss of Bakhmut will mean the collapse of the last offensive line standing in the way of Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, which means Ukraine's eastern position will rapidly contract to its fourth and weakest defensive belt. He called Ukraine's efforts there an astonishing commitment. In March, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said his troops had killed over 1,100 Russians in just a few days. Russia then said in just one day it had killed 220 Ukrainian troops. Still, in January, a Ukrainian commander said so far the exchange rate of trading our lives for theirs favors the Russians. If this goes on like this, we could run out. It's been a horrible battle, a virtual meat grinder for many young men. Of course, it's more than symbolic for Russia, otherwise Ukraine wouldn't be putting troops from other battles to fight there. When we started making the show, a former Azov commander said many more soldiers had died in heavy fighting. The Russians, he said, were throwing everything they had at the city. Rather than catastrophic for Ukraine, he said their offensive potential is noticeably decreasing. He added, if we lose some positions in the city, there are enough forces around the city to put pressure and destroy the enemy. It's estimated that Russia has lost around 20,000 people in the city since it invaded in July last year. Ukraine might have lost as many. It's hard to say what the numbers are, because it doesn't help any side if the numbers are shocking to their citizens. The Russian fatalities include Wagner mercenaries as well as Russian army personnel. Evgeny Prigozhin, who we mentioned earlier, as the man behind the Wagner group, said in May that he'd withdraw his men if he didn't receive more men and supplies. Later, he criticized Putin and said, one of the defense ministry's units fled from one of our flanks, abandoning their positions. Everyone fled. He said in a video, a soldier shouldn't die because of his leader's absolute stupidity. The commands they receive from the top are absolutely criminal. That was good news for Ukraine. Ukrainian officials have said holding Bakhmut is key to Ukraine's counteroffensive being successful. It's true that for a while things were very difficult for Ukraine in Bakhmut, but this has changed despite the place looking like hell on earth. At least the 70,000 people who live in the city have managed to get out, or many of them have at least. About 10,000 old folks are still there, putting up with daily shelling and other kinds of hell. Just recently, a Ukrainian military spokesperson reported, Our warriors exhausted the Wagner Group, and the enemy is forced to use special units and assault units to fight. That's the word on the street that Russia has exhausted itself in Bakhmut. A Ukrainian military commander believes that Russia has made a big mistake. He says his troops will take advantage of Russia's exhaustion just as soon as those weapons, equipment, and ammunition get there. We're told Russia is done with putting more effort into taking over the city, but we should know that in a war, it's, as the expression goes, not over until the fat lady sings. But new intel, some of which has come from the leak, tells us that Russia is now on their back foot. The British Ministry of Defense says Russia has started building one of the biggest military defense systems since World War II. These defenses are not only close to the current front, but are also deep inside areas Russia currently controls. This includes around the northern border of occupied Crimea, including what the British has said was a multi-layered defense zone near the village of Medvedivka. Russia has been busy digging hundreds of miles of deep trenches and constructing anti-tank cement pyramids that are inside internationally recognized Russian territory. What could this mean? Well, at first glance, you'd assume that the information in the leaks about Ukraine not being able or ready to launch an offensive is not what Vladimir Putin and his inner circle are thinking. The British say it means either Russia is now preparing for a major breakthrough by Ukrainian forces, or perhaps less likely, the defenses have been ordered by local commanders and civil leaders in an attempt to promote the official narrative that Russia is threatened by Ukraine and NATO. You'll understand shortly why Russia would go to such effort. It looks like British intelligence thinks it's much more likely that Russia does indeed think that very soon Ukraine will strike and strike big. That might have already happened by the time this video comes out. If so, was Ukraine underestimated? That'll become clear soon. 
What's more is there's been multiple reports of sabotage inside Russian-occupied cities of Ukraine. A train was derailed in the city of Melitopol, where Russia had been sending what was reported as extremely important cargo. Such attacks have happened in other border regions, which tells us that Ukraine's counteroffensive is about to begin. Ukraine has said that we can expect to see more sabotage of vital oil and transport infrastructure in the coming weeks. Anton Gerashenko, advisor to the Ukrainian Internal Affairs Ministry, told Newsweek in May, We can only assume that the partisan activity on Russia's territory regarding the logistical centers, oil infrastructure, and transport infrastructure will increase in intensity. He said such high-visibility attacks hurt Russia psychologically, not knowing who's behind them. That includes a drone attack on the Kremlin. So the intel now looks bright for Ukraine compared to what we saw in those documents. Winter was indeed harsh for both sides. But now the mud is getting harder as air defenses and Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 main battle tanks get ready to battle, and the outlook is better, it seems. Now some analysts are saying everything is in place for Ukraine, and it'll likely make a major play for the Zaporizhia region in order to disrupt Russia's supply lines. Ukrainian forces would do well to capture Melitopol, and this would effectively split Russian forces in half across the front. Melitopol is key. If they take that, the Ukrainians will move to the Azov Sea, which will mean that supply and communication lines to Crimea are severed. Let's just remember that analysts were saying things like this less than a year ago. Reality is that Ukraine has about as much chance of winning a war against Russia as Mexico would of winning a war with the United States. There's a lot of talk of Ukraine trying to take back Crimea. With all those weapons from the US, UK, Canada, and Germany putting Crimea in range of Ukrainian weapon systems, it's very possible, but, and this is a big but, everything might not go Ukraine's way. After all, as we've seen, war is hard to predict, not just on the battlefield, but in the hearts and minds of the rest of the world. Bear in mind, recent articles such as this from the Washington Post headlined, Senior Ukrainian officials fear counterattack may not live up the hype. The Ukrainian defense minister said, The expectation from our counteroffensive campaign is overestimated in the world. Most people are waiting for something huge. He warned that this could result in emotional disappointment. Hmm, okay, so we're back to what the Pentagon leak said. Stalemate. If the counteroffensive fails for Ukraine, it's hard to see where it'll go from there. A failure could be devastating. All-out victory, yet again, will seem like a bridge too far, and the non-fighting main actors in this war might push for various end-of-war contingencies. If Ukraine fails in this counteroffensive, the pressure to negotiate peace will increase. Russia seems very much committed to an attritional war, and Ukraine's losses might become too much for Ukraine and its supporters. Let's remember its citizens are also living in economic turmoil, and this war has caused economic turmoil all over Europe and beyond. Some analysts are saying Ukraine has actually lost 150,000 troops killed in action, plus Russia has a lot more men in reserve. So yes, thinking this counteroffensive is a nailed-on victory for Ukraine is wishful thinking. That 150,000 number might be well over the top, but if it's anything even close to the truth, support for the war might wane. There are three possible outcomes. 1. The West delivers everything Ukraine wants for its fight, and if this happens, Ukraine may well win a decisive victory. 2. Ukraine doesn't get what it wants, and Russia wins. In either case, whoever wins sets the terms of the peace. But then there's the third matter. The battle just continues, costing more and more lives and more money, and wreaking havoc on economies worldwide. If there is a stalemate, there will be more international pressure to seek negotiations. The elections in the US and UK will matter, since this expensive war will figure into the candidate's mandates. Remember that the US's greatest threat is China, not Russia. You also have to think about talk of nuclear weapons being used. Politicians will talk about this in the run-up to the elections. An analyst writing on the RAND Corporation website recently said, Once other conventional escalatory options have been exhausted, Moscow may resort to nuclear weapons, and specifically NSNW use, to prevent a catastrophic defeat. Just the thought of that might change how much support the war receives. If Putin did do that, the US and NATO would have to retaliate. It would be a terrifying situation. A protracted war doesn't bode well for Ukraine, so this counteroffensive means a lot. A protracted war means high energy and food prices, which means havoc in many pockets of the world, as well as possibly hundreds of thousands of premature deaths. If Ukraine fails to win entirely, then the US and other nations might attempt to broker a ceasefire. But if Ukraine has obvious momentum, it will likely receive ongoing support. But importantly, very importantly, there is little support for Ukraine and the US from the global south, which includes countries presently making economic deals with China and Russia. In spite of Russian brutality and Putin's ugly imperialism, 
They have lambasted the U.S. for what they call a proxy war, just another proxy war that the U.S. has been involved in over decades of its global hegemony. Some are talking about a post-American world in which the U.S. doesn't get to dictate global matters. The Intercept recently wrote, after decades of aggression and abuses of its own, much of the world seems to have concluded that the U.S. credibility has run dry on such matters. This is incredibly important on how this war pans out if Ukraine fails in its counteroffensive. Regardless of what happens in the next few months, it's hard to see much stability in this region for many years to come. The U.S. might have to arm Ukraine in those years, which will affect how the U.S. deals with trouble elsewhere, namely in China. Some analysts think if Putin is ousted, someone worse will follow, especially if Russia will be punished with severe reparations. Ukraine will take a lot of arming. Europe will have to live with instability. Many analysts say it's unlikely this war will end soon and peace will prevail on the planet. We're in for a rough ride, a new Cold War, but various politicians will make it their objective to prevent this. Still, some people think we're heading toward the politics of restraint, a multipolar world order which agrees to peace and wants prosperity for all. The US, though, doesn't believe in China's talk about global peace. What matters is some countries do. Parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America look to be charting a new course in the slipstream of China. This is more than just a counteroffensive and intelligence leaks, it's more than a war in Ukraine. We are in an epoch of profound political changes and perhaps running into a conflict that might devastate the planet. The next few months are going to be interesting. We can't see Russia or Ukraine accepting defeat, but as we've discussed, will the world accept protracted fighting? If not, what will happen next? Now you need to watch what if every nuclear bomb on Earth exploded at the same time or have a look at how it works, the atomic bomb.